Hello, this is Dave W7UUU, and today I'm at the clubhouse with Stefan, and he's going to go ahead and give us another interview. So go ahead and take it away, Stefan. Good morning. I'm Stefan, or Steve Morton, 87AB. I get called a lot of things, so we just have a lot of fun with it. I got started in ham radio, well, radio back in the 1960s with uh, CB Radio. I was working for Tronson's Better Mobile Homes over on 96th and South Tacoma Way. I was cleaning mobile homes, but then I started assisting uh, the drivers with moving the mobile homes out to private properties. And we were using CB radios, six channel, that's all we had back then. And we would use those for communications to go down the highway to get the homes to their new locations. And then from there, around 1972, I got drafted and went in the Navy. And that's when I became real heavy into CB radio because of avionics. So I started in avionics in the Navy. And we went, uh, I was in Millington, Tennessee, where I bought my first base station, Courier 23 channel. I think the interesting part of that was based on licensing requirements by the FCC back then, we weren't allowed to communicate long distances. So my old call sign was potato chip and I was talking with uh, some folks in Chicago all the way from Memphis, Tennessee. It was an amazing experience. I was only 18 so still kind of fun. We went from uh, that to my first ship, the USS Juno, in 1973. No, it was late 72. I got to the Juno, and we were. Uh, I was working in avionics. I also did uh, air controlman uh, work. With the avionics, I worked with a few other folks that were into just regular electronics with the communications equipment on board ship. And I learned a lot from those guys, and it kept me interested in uh, electronics, avionics, or communications. And then um, as time went by, I got to my next ship in uh, 75. One of the biggest things I did there was to be able to communicate via Mars Radio, Military Affiliated Radio Service. What ship was that? Uh, that was the USS Bristol County. She was a... Um, LST, uh, the last of the LSTs of that time, and we had some great cruises. We even went to Australia and uh, ran our Marines up on shore via the ramp of the ship because the bow ramp would drop down onto the beach and the uh, vehicles that the Marines had on board the ship would all drive off and go do uh, beach style exercises. So there's a lot going on with that. And then we went into the um, Indian Ocean, so I got to see both Sydney and Pearl. Uh, Australia was a great country, really had a good time with it. Coming back out of there, I ended up going back to uh, San Diego for lab school, so I'm staying in uh, technical fields as a lab tech. And gosh, the stuff I did for the Navy as a lab tech was just amazing the opportunities they gave me. I was able to be the LPO of um, one, one of uh, five departments in the Department of Laboratory Medicine at uh, the Old Pink Palace. A bunch of you might remember that for San Diego. The San Diego went to the new hospital, I think it was right around 1986, 1987. And then by then, I had become an instructor uh, via the Naval School of Health Sciences, and I was teaching lab work at that point up until the time I retired. And then the technology kept kicking in phase after phase after phase. And oh, I, I started my education for uh, college uh, in October of uh, 1987, and then by uh, April of 92, I graduated with three bachelors and a master's through National University in San Diego. Um, I, I was blown away at the opportunities that I had uh, and had a lot of fun with just the learning experience. There was so much to learn because it was really in the early stages of a lot of the technology that we're playing with today, uh, the high-powered uh, computers that everybody's running. 
uh, the communications with computers, it's taking off and just going rampant worldwide. Um, this hobby alone just amazes the daylights out of me. But I had my last um, Mars contact um, in the middle of the Red Sea as we traveled from the Indian Ocean up into the Mediterranean with the uh, USS Kitty Hawk. Um, that was an amazing experience because we were taking the ship to back to Philadelphia from San Diego so that the ship could go through the Life Extension Program, SLEP, <laughs> is what we called it. But we had a lot of fun doing that. And then um, I retired from the Navy in 92, um, still learning a lot, still educating, uh, kept just kept blowing the side lights off of everything that I was capable of doing, but everything I kept learning. So one of my favorite sayings is, don't ever stop learning because the day you quit is the day you die. Learn, learn, learn for the rest of your life. Just keep it up because you never know what you're going to come up with and there's always something new. Then around 2002, um, I was uh, consulting here in the local area for IT work. And I ran into an old friend, John Robson, AC7LK, and he brought me into the radio club at Tacoma. I lived in Tacoma all my life, except for my career in the Navy, and never knew about this club. It blew my socks off when I found out about the club because there's so much going on here, so much that you can learn, so much that you can do to help other people. It's, it's an amazing world that I just keep thinking about and keep having fun with. So John got me started because we set up the first IRLP system here at the club, um, which basically was just getting started in 1997. And IRLP is all about um, an individual being able to connect into a repeater system, get one, get the repeater system they're on connected to another one in some other part of the world and talk to the locals in that part. And we talked to Sydney, Australia, and then uh, I got to talk to uh, Africa, so I was into Nigeria. Um, I got to talk to England, Ireland, and I'm mostly Irish, so that was a lot of fun getting to speak with some old family members back there. I got to talk with Hong Kong uh, via the uh, IRLP system, so there's a lot involved with uh, who all we could talk with, even just as a technician class licensee. In 2003, September, I was able to get my extra class license uh, with the help of Jerry Seligman. He's my predecessor for what I currently do with the club today, which is I'm teaching classes here at the clubhouse for technician. Um, I'm the instructor coordinator, so I've got uh, myself, Dave Brooks, and um, Greg. Great guys, they do the uh, general and the extra class. Those classes are like 10 weeks, two hours on Monday nights. I do mine on the uh, weekend before the second Tuesday of the month, um, simply because the second Tuesday is for testing. So we do testing here at the club, and uh, we've got full-on uh, teaching skills at, because uh, all of my instructors have uh, training via the military. Uh, Dave Brooks has his via the Navy because he was a radioman. I've got mine via the Navy because I was a Navy corpsman. Um, I became a Navy corpsman in 73 after I got back from my first Westpac. Um, so in, 70, or in 2003, I was able to um, get my extra class license, and that's when Jerry Seligman brought me in, and uh, I started learning how to teach ham radio. Jerry was a great guy. He taught ham radio here at the club for something like 30 years, and uh, he was Air Force trained, so he was certified via the Air Force. Got a lot of military experience here, which is really kind of astounding uh, how much the military is able to give back to the public. Um, it's a tradition that I am not willing to let go of. Um, it's one that we want to keep up with and uh, keep teaching people how to do things, keep bringing up the technologies that are available to us, and so forth. 
Then in 2006, Jerry passed away and I ended up taking over as the uh, training coordinator for the Radio Club at Tacoma. And I've been doing the classes ever since 2006. And we've gone through a lot of training. And right now we're at about 76 people that we've trained for technician class licenses. And 97% uh, of those people have gone on to get their licenses with the FCC. So it's kind of amazing how far the club keeps going. And more and more people are come up, coming up. I got a class on the 6th and 7th of January, 2024. And I've already got uh, 12 people signed up and a few more are coming. So we'll see how that goes. But nonetheless, lots and lots and lots of fun. Are you also teaching uh, general and extra classes? I'm not at the moment, um, but I am planning to start working with Dave Brooks uh, towards the end of uh, January because his next class starts the 22nd of January. And I'm going to come back in and get caught up on uh, a lot of the new stuff that's now being taught via the manuals. And I'm going to start working with Dave again just to get back in and get more familiar with the uh, general and the extra class material so that if something happens, uh, we've at least got some backup. And that's one thing that we could use more of is uh, people who are willing to teach and willing to back up uh, the current instructors because you never know what's going to happen. Crazy things happen. So what are some things uh, that you've done with the club, uh, fun stuff? Have you done any field days, any activities that you've participated in that you can think of? Uh, I think I've missed one field day uh, since 2002, and that was because um, we had the pandemic. But um, I've hit every one of the field days, uh, and every one has been different. They're lots and lots of fun. Um, it's a contest weekend that goes from uh, Saturday morning through Sunday morning, 24 hours, and we make as many contacts throughout the United States as we possibly can. And we've had some pretty good certifications come through where we've actually won the contests. Um, that's been a lot of fun. Doing a lot of the teaching that I do is really a gas because I use some different styles for teaching because my course is a crash course. So it's not a course that uh, you plan out, get very detailed with. This is one that you come in and you get the basics following the manual and you're ready to pass the test uh, after two days. And based on what I've been able to calculate, the class itself is the equivalent of a one semester course in two days. And so there's a lot in it, but it's still a lot of fun and gets everybody involved so that they can uh, get a feel for what the hobby is like. And then, of course, we start working with all the equipment that's available. Um, some of the newer technology that's come out here recently has been just unexplainable. Um, everything's starting to focus in on software-based radios. You still have to have a transmit and a receiver, but the software is running everything. And there's a lot involved in the software and making sure that it works with the different radios. And we've still got all the same manufacturers. In fact, we've got a couple of new ones, like, um, well, what was the name of that one? Um, they picked up off of uh, Motorola's software and they've built their own digital mobile radio. Anytone, the Anytone radios, they're just magnificent when it comes to using the um, uh, technology that was originally developed in the early 2000s via Motorola. So Motorola has had a big hand in a lot of the development of the technology over the course of the years. Um, and then we've still got ICOM and Yesu and Kenwood, Alinco. Elcraft is an American company and they are just magnificent when it comes to a lot of their equipment. Another American company is Flex Radio. I am just amazed at how Flex Radio continues down the road of technology. They started with software defined radio back, I believe it was in the early 2000s. And uh, with what they've currently got going with their 6000 series radios, it's just amazing. I got the 6300 just the same year that it came out. 
I'm still using that same radio today and I have so much fun making contacts worldwide, even into Africa, Europe every once in a while. Of course, a lot of that depends upon solar conditions. We get enough sunspots going, then of course we get enough traffic going around the world that we're able to make a whole ton of contacts that are literally unexpected. South America. Um, I had the um, ICOM 706 Mark IIG, put it on two meters, went through a satellite and spoke to uh, Antarctica. Wow. Um, that for me was just amazing. It was almost like a repeater system that we got to talk through via the satellite. So that was a lot, that was a great contact for me. So what do you think the future of ham radio holds, say 10 years, 20 years, 50 years from now? I think ham radio is going to continue to hold its basic structure. And, and I think one of the greatest things about ham radio is there is no infrastructure. You know, the inter you've got the internet, you've got uh, repeater systems that are connected to the internet, uh, i.e. the police systems, the, the uh, fire department systems, and so forth, big government systems. They're all reliant upon the internet, satellites, and things of that nature. Whereas ham radio is not dependent upon any kind of infrastructure other than the individual having a radio and being able to talk worldwide. That for me is one of the greatest aspects of this hobby. Even though today seems like the bleeding edge of technology, which a lot of the stuff in the hobby is bleeding technology, it's going to continue to grow. Um, there's so much growth that we've got coming. For every growth period we get, we've got a bigger future ahead of us that we can continue to grow and expand. And so I think that's one of our greatest facets throughout life and history. How do you think that might manifest in amateur radio? I think eventually um, we'll integrate a, a form of television technology into it. Um, we've got a few old pieces of technology where television was implemented in radio, but it didn't stick real well. But I think with the focus going towards software to find radio, uh, with everything being software connected, I think that's going to grow in the future and become a lot easier. Another thing that uh, a major facet that the FCC has has come across is getting rid of the limitations in bandwidths and data speeds that we can transmit at. We now have full access to a three kilohertz uh, bandwidth to where we can start stuffing a lot of data into that signal and just expand the growth of uh, ham radio as it is today. Uh, getting video into it is going to make a greater personalization of you will, if you will, with um, being able to speak to other people instead of just hearing them. We can now get more into being able to visualize what they're actually talking about. And communications are going to expand like crazy because what you're developing in one state can be completely different, but yet integratable technology that more and more people can work with. So the direction that a lot of this is going is even today just amazing. Well, do you have any parting words that you want to um, have recorded for posterity about amateur radio and the Radio Club of Tacoma? Continue to grow. I, I don't think I can say that enough because there is so much in this hobby. One of the amazing parts is that you can step in and it's a lifetime hobby and you can go down one path and that one path can be your lifetime goal. Uh, doing the whole hobby itself at least why it's in the early stages could be a bit overwhelming, but there's so much to learn and so much growth factor becoming involved in it that just don't give up. Don't give up. It's like I could throw some religion in this, but I'll be careful with that. We're always looking to grow with Jesus, and Jesus is a lifetime experience. Ham radio has come into that point also. It is so expansive, it's just unreal. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Stephen. I appreciate that. Thank you, Dave. It's been a pleasure. Really enjoyed it.